Thank you. So I'm a historian, but most of all, I'm a teacher. And in teaching about the subject of free speech, I've gotten one question over and over again. Why allow it? Especially, why allow it for people that say hurtful, hateful, misinformed, and harmful things? I want to say that's a good question. I think it is the question. And because I'm a historian, to answer it, I like to tell a story. The story I tell is about Mary Beth Tinker. That's a name you may have heard, because Mary Beth Tinker was the 13-year-old who wore a black armband to middle school in Des Moines, Iowa in 1965 to protest American involvement in the Vietnam War. She was sent home because the school officials said this was inappropriate speech for the school. And eventually, she became a plaintiff in the most important free speech case about schools, Tinker v. Des Moines. Four years later, the Supreme Court said that she did have the right to wear that symbol because, the court said, neither teachers nor students shed their First Amendment rights at the schoolhouse gate. Now, Mary Beth Tinker is not that much older than I am. And appearances notwithstanding, I'm not that old. She's a peer, and she's become a friend. And a few years ago, she came to my class here at Penn. And she told her story about the black armband. And then the questions began. And the first student said, look, Ms. Tinker, you were fighting the good fight. You were fighting the war in Vietnam. This Milo Yiannopoulos clown, this Ann Coulter jokester, if it were today, we might say Kanye West or Kyrie Irving. They just hurt people. Why should they be allowed to speak? And this is what Mary Beth Tinker said. She said, look, at Warren G. Harding Middle School in Des Moines in 1965, there were kids in my class that had dads and brothers and uncles that were fighting and dying in Southeast Asia. You don't think they were hurt by this snot-nosed kid telling them that their loved ones were risking everything for a lie? You don't think that hurt them? Of course it hurt them. It hurt them. Speech hurts. If it doesn't hurt somebody, it's probably not that meaningful or important. Meaningful speech hurts. Of course I hurt people. But if that becomes your rubric, if that becomes your barometer for what's allowed or not, forget about Mary Beth Tinker. Forget about free speech altogether. Well, then another student said, look, isn't this whole free speech debate just an abstraction? Isn't this really about power, like some people have it and others don't? And the people with power love to talk about free speech because that allows them to lord it over people who don't. Mary Beth Tinker wasn't having that either. She said, look, let's remember in 1965 at Warren G. Harding Middle School, I was 13. I was a kid. Speech was the only power that I had. And if you take it away, it's going to be the people at the bottom. It's going to be the people with the least power that lose. Yes, speech hurts. But the people at the bottom need it so they can critique what they're experiencing. Um, so uh, this is a cartoon by the great Sidney Wilkinson, who illustrated a book that I wrote on this subject. Uh, Signe is the first woman in the history of the United States to win the Pulitzer Prize for cartooning. And to me, this really embodies the central argument that I'm making. Um, do you think that white supremacists in the South were hurt by Martin Luther King's speech? I think they were. They absolutely were. But that, that's not an argument to deny his speech or anybody's. So in the book that we wrote, we lay out four basic arguments for why free speech matters, why you should give a damn. 
um, you'll see it allows us to criticize our leaders. It allows minorities to challenge their oppression. It allows us to read, look, and watch the literature and film that we choose. And it allows students and teachers to speak their minds in school, ideally. The point and the reason we study history is that all of these things have been observed in the breach. Really, I should have written, they should allow. Because over and over, they haven't, which is precisely why we need to study the past. So we remember how delicate, how tenuous all of this is. Um, so let's take the first one, uh, um, that uh, free speech allows us to criticize our government. Um, well, you know what? Over time, it hasn't. It should, but it hasn't, especially in wartime. So in the 1790s, it looks like we're going to go to war with France, because France was capturing some of our ships and demanding bribes. And so John Adams' administration, which included the great Alexander Hamilton, they just passed laws saying that you can't criticize the American government. Yeah, those were called the Alien and Sedition Acts. You just can't criticize the government. There was somebody in the opposing party that was jailed under this, who was a member of Congress and then got reelected while he was in jail. Yeah. Go up to the next war, the Civil War. Well, if you're in the Union, uh, if you're in the North, Abraham Lincoln's America, you can get jailed for saying something friendly about the Confederacy. Lincoln jailed hundreds of Confederate sympathizers, of people he thought were Confederate sympathizers, and he closed newspapers that he thought were uh, um, not you know, sufficiently solicitous to the Northern cause. Um, uh, never mind that Abraham Lincoln himself had been an anti-war protester or activist during the Mexican War, criticizing James Polk for the war. And also, and this is really important, Abraham Lincoln came to regret all of this. Because he said, hmm, the battle cry of freedom. And of course, that's what you know, young men from the North are singing as they go into the war. How do we respect that if we're also denying it? And he came to regret closing these newspapers. He instructed his generals not to close any more of them. He reopened the Chicago Times, which was actually his hometown newspaper, and said he had made a mistake. And that began a grand or not so grand tradition in this country of censors coming to regret their censorship. So go to the next war, the, the First World War. Um, here in Philadelphia, where we are tonight, uh, Charles Schenck, the president of the Socialist Party, he's jailed for handing out uh, anti-draft pamphlets, pamphlets criticizing the draft. And uh, that case makes its way to the Supreme Court. And it's in that case that Oliver Wendell Holmes makes the famous comment, freedom of speech does not include shouting, falsely shouting fire in a crowded theater. He says, look, there's a war going on, right? It's an emergency. Either you're on our team or you're on the other team. And we can't afford to let anyone play for the other team. But Holmes would come to regret this decision almost immediately. A year later, a guy named Abrams is also arrested for distributing Yiddish language newspapers criticizing the United States invasion of Bolshevik Russia. Most Americans do not know this fact, but we did invade Bolshevik Russia. These pamphlets criticized it. And um, uh, that too was upheld, and Abrams has to go to jail. But in that case, Holmes is in the, you know, in, in the dissenting party. He says it's a mistake. Um, uh, and it's in that case, the Abrams case, where he says, persecution for the expression of opinion seems to me perfectly logical. If you have no doubt about your premises or your power and you want a certain result with all your heart, you naturally express your wishes in law and you sweep away all opposition. What he's saying is that censorship is natural. It really is, right? It's natural to want to muzzle somebody that you disagree with or that you find abhorrent. But that's precisely why we have to resist that impulse. Um, so that's the first one. Free speech allows us, or should allow us, to um, uh, criticize our leaders. The next one is that free speech allows racial and gender and sexual minorities, or it should allow them, to challenge their oppression. What's the first mass censorship campaign in American history? Well, it happens in 1831 after Nat Turner's rebellion. This is what happens. White supremacists in the South are justly afraid of anti-slavery literature. And so um, uh, what they do is, because they have so much power in Congress, they're able to restrict it in all kinds of ways. 
Anti-slavery literature is banned from the US mails. It's even banned from the floor of Congress. That's right. Uh, the so-called gag rule, which prevented anti-slavery petitions from the halls of Congress. That's what happened. And this is why Frederick Douglass, himself a survivor of slavery, called free speech the great moral renovator of society. If he doesn't have free speech, he can't criticize slavery. That's the point. All right? Unfortunately, we live in a moment where some people have imagined this thing called social justice and this thing called free speech intention. They are not intention. And people like Frederick Douglass would roll over in their grave if they heard that. They needed free speech to critique their oppression. Think about the feminist movement. Go back to the campaign for women's suffrage. They were jailed. Mobs attacked them for speaking their minds. Um, think about, speaking of feminism, the campaign for birth control. Um, I'm sure many of you have heard the name Margaret Sanger, um, the godmother of Planned Parenthood and contraceptive services. Margaret Sanger is arrested in 1914 because she violates an obscenity law by printing information about contraception. In a journal called, by the way, The Woman Rebel, she gets a 45-year sentence, and she runs away to England. She came back after it was commuted. Think about the movement for gay. Today, we would say LGBT rights. It shouldn't surprise you that an identity and a behavior that's so deeply stigmatized that people had a very difficult time connecting with each other in every way because their magazines and their literature were so heavily censored. So there were gay-themed magazines going back to the early 20th century, but the government censors them constantly. And it's only after the Supreme Court in the late 50s and the early 60s says that gays have a right to communicate in this way that the gay rights movement really takes off. And of course, right, it couldn't take off without that, right? People couldn't communicate and connect without that literature. So if you believe in gay rights, you have to believe in free speech, because it was absolutely integral to the cause. The civil rights movement itself, the NAACP and its literature, is banned all over the American South. And this is why W.B. Du Bois, one of the founders of that organization, and Martin Luther King Jr., are absolute, absolutist about free speech. They need it. If you take it away, they can't campaign for justice. Um, and I'll say, if you censor it, again, people at the bottom will suffer the most. So if you fast forward to 1987, the University of Michigan passed, uh, passed instituted a speech code. And it said that we won't allow uh, any speech that uh, stigmatizes an individual based on race, ethnicity, religion, sex, or sexual orientation. Sounds good to me until you study it. And you find out that in the first 18 months, 20 African American students were penalized for violating this. One of them was penalized for using the term white trash. Now, I wouldn't necessarily call that a racist term. In fact, I know I wouldn't. But the point is, other people did. It's in the eye of the beholder. And those beholders will make life impossible for people at the bottom if you start banning free speech. Um, the next argument for free speech is it allows us, or it should allow us, to consume the art and film and literature of our choice. When I was in high school in the mid-1970s, I come home one day and I'm holding the book by D.H. Lawrence, Sons and Lovers. Uh, and my dad laughs, and he said, you know, when I was a kid, I couldn't read that. You know why? Because it was banned in America. Uh, there were underground versions that, you know, uh, uh, people handed around. And there were also expurgated versions that, according to my dad, took it out of the good parts. Uh, well, again, thanks to the courts, we, got, we were allowed to read those. But before the 50s and 60s, federal customs officials would um, you know, uh, confiscate any D.H. Lawrence novels that came into the ports. In fact, there was a customs official who was asked to define what a classic was. And he said, a classic is a dirty book that someone's trying to get by me. You name a classic author. It was censored. Hemingway, Joyce, Faulkner, um, uh, Lawrence, all that stuff, all censored. Think about film. 
Um, after we get electronic entertainment, uh, you know, we get Nickelodeons and then, and then uh, silent movies and then talkies. Every state starts passing laws heavily restricting what you can show on a screen. These laws are very fun to read, and I'd like to read one of, uh, one of them for you. It's uh, the Maryland law of the early 20th century. Uh, and uh, Maryland said that you can't show films that include suggestive comedy, stories built on illicit love, overpassionate love scenes, disrespect for the law, men and women living together in adultery, drinking and gambling made attractive, prolonged success to criminals, maternity scenes, and titles calculated to stir up racial hatred and antagonistic relations between labor and capital. In other words, anything that's interesting, right? Uh, sex and violence and politics. Um, uh, there were film censors that ordered the removal of a scene showing a woman breastfeeding, and there was a review board in Memphis that rejected a film showing a racially integrated classroom because they said it would, quote, offend the sensibilities of the South, by which it meant, of course, the white South. Was that true? Did it offend sensibilities? Um, yes. Yes, it did. Meaningful speech and meaningful art does. Again, if it doesn't, it's probably not very meaningful. And last, all right, last, oh, um, free speech allows us, or should allow us, to speak our minds at school. Um, for most of American history, it didn't. Students and teachers had no speech rights. They date, yes, to the movement for racial justice in the 1960s. In the early 60s, African American students started to wear one man, one vote buttons, which was from uh, SNCC, from a civil rights movement uh, organization. Uh, they're sent home. Um, uh, and eventually courts said they could do that, provided that they didn't interfere with learning in the schools. And that became the basis for Tinker v. Des Moines, for Mary Beth Tinker's case. Mary Beth Tinker's family also came out of the civil rights movement. Her father was a civil rights activist. He was a minister who was pushed out of his pulpit because he demanded integrated swimming pools. Um, uh, and Ultimately, uh, Mary Beth Tinker is allowed to say what she wants. It took a couple of years. But we're now living in a time when lots and lots of people in our schools cannot say what they want. Think about the new laws banning critical race theory in schools. Think about the Florida don't say gay law. Think about uh, efforts to remove the book Mouse by Art Spiegelman. Think about the effort to remove Toni Morrison's beloved. All justified, like censorship always is, in the idiom of harm. These ideas, these images will hurt us. They will harm us. We can't see them. We can't allow our young people to see them. And let me emphasize that that impulse is bipartisan. The recent measures that I mentioned are brought to you almost entirely by the Republican Party. And yet, one of the most banned books in the history of the United States in recent years is Mark Twain's Huck Finn. Another one is um, uh, To Kill a Mockingbird by Harper Lee. And that censorship did not come from the right. It came from the left. And the justification was exactly the same. There are images and words and slurs in these books that are going to hurt us. They're hateful. They're going to harm us. Get rid of them. Get rid of them now, all right, before they do more harm. Look, I get it. I get it. Speech hurts. And I understand, like Holmes did, the impulse to censor it. I've felt it. But we need to raise our voices against hate speech instead of trying to blot it out. Criticizing racist speech is a form of free speech in its own right. But that's very different from denying speech to someone else. That never ends well. It turns its targets into martyrs. And it betrays a lack of confidence in democracy itself. 
If we believe in our ability to govern ourselves, we need to let every citizen speak their mind. And we need to believe that that messy cacophony is going to yield a more just and fair society than any set of censors can possibly create. It was Frederick Douglass who said that liberty is meaningless where the right to, utters one, to utter one's thoughts and opinions has ceased to exist. Douglass was a survivor of slavery. He knew vastly more about the inequities and the brutalities of America than most Americans. But, but, he also knew that we could never make anything right, anything right, if we forsook our right to free speech. We need to remember the brave women and men who raised their voices for justice, often at incredible risk to themselves. And we need to speak up again for free speech, which remains our best vehicle for righting the wrongs that are all around us. Let free speech ring. Let free speech ring. Anything less will diminish us all. Thanks very much.